Good morning. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, Grace, you can confirm if you can hear me from your end. Uh, good morning, Sharon. Now you're very audible. Thank you so much. Karibu. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to start our session. We don't want to take much of your time. My name is Sharon from Tax Education. And today we are going to train on VAT auto-populated return. First of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank all of you for attending this session this morning, this very cold morning. I can say Karibu. And um, I would like to take uh, this time to introduce our two panelists, or Grace, probably you can introduce yourself and Paul and what you do at Kenya Revenue Authority. Then we can start our session. Grace, maybe you can just go ahead. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, good morning, everybody, once again. We apologize for the technical hitches uh, we've experienced. Uh, so we've started a bit late. But uh, for purposes of introduction, my name is Grace Gadea. I am domiciled in uh, domestic taxes department, specifically the business transformation office, uh, who's practically in charge of the VAT auto-populated return rollout. Back to you, Sharon. Thank you, Grace. Again, in the session, we have uh, Paul. Paul, maybe you can also say a word. Sorry, I think Paul, you are not mute. You are muted. Just a moment. Sorry for that. Uh, maybe you can just give Paul some few seconds so that she can he can come on board. Paul, maybe you can now speak. Are you able to? Yes, I'm able. Uh, good morning, okay. everyone. Yes, uh, my name is Paul Derek from uh, E-Teams Operations Office. Uh, welcome for the session. Thank you, Paul. Um, Grace, maybe you can just go ahead and start the session. Um, I'd like to take you through the VAT auto-populated return. Um, Sharon, please confirm you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Now, I'll just give you a brief walkthrough of uh, the journey to of the VAT auto-populated return. We'll start off with an introduction. So the auto-populated VAT return is an enhancement of the VAT return that was to be rolled out in January 2024, uh, but through a public notice issued on 12 February 2024. So the rollout did take effect from February 2024. So if you can remember, we rolled it out in February for purposes of filing of the VAT return for February 2024, but due to some and foreseen challenges between um, what we say, the integrations between mostly affecting teams between taxpayers' devices and the suppliers, we heeded to your complaints and concerns and frustrations, and we did a switch off of the same. On, it was 20th 
of March 2024. Grace, we lost you. Am I back now? Yes, yes. I'm back. And the screen as well? Yes. Yes, the we can see the screen. Uh, some people are saying they can't see, but I don't know. Maybe they can check on their end because I can see it. I think I had dropped off for a, a, a while back. Sorry about that. Okay. So now I'm back. I think there was an issue with my connection. So the objective of the auto-populated return is very simple. It is just basically to enhance the VAT compliance and the transparency in the return declarations. We would also like uh, um, you appreciate that in line uh, the pre-population pre of the VAT return, it is an international best practice of TADAT. TADAT stands for Tax Administration and Diagnostic Assessment Tool. So as an organization, we are looking at also applying international best practices. With the best practices. So in time, the return is aimed at improving customer service uh, experience through a simplified. Is that, am I audible? Sharon. Hello, yes, Grace. Oh, so everyone else who's saying I cannot be heard, maybe check your connection so that I don't want to lose anyone. Sorry about that. Now, uh, the vision of the auto populated return, because this was just this the start point, was actually availing CSV files relating to section B, section uh, D and E and F G of the VAT return. The end goal of the VAT auto-populated return at some point will basically be when, when you uh, access your VAT return from the portal, everything has already been pre-filled for you. Currently, right now, we are just availing the CSV files for you. And I believe even right now, during the VAT filing season, the, v the CSV files are still available when you download, when you click the download option of the VAT auto populated return. The only difference is the validation rules that we've put in place in the VAT return have been switched off. And that is what we did in March uh, 20th, 2024. And just to recap what I had mentioned before my connection, I lost connection. One of the key reasons we looked at was the biggest uh, group of taxpayers who've done onboarding of teams were their highest affected. Actually, the issues relating to uh, invoices on pe for people who have onboarded on e-teams uh, were not so many, but for teams, uh, they, that was the biggest gap. And we realized there was an issue with how the devices had been in terms of integration with suppliers. So we needed to sit down, have discussions with the suppliers and align all the everything that we would want um, availed or how it, we would want the invoices availed to the taxpayers in relation to the autopopulated return. The reality is the VAT autopopulated return is not going anywhere. It is here to stay. Uh, this is the new... This is the new um, form of filing. This is the new form of filing, and this is what we shall apply. So we move on to the next slide. Now, I know there has been I know there has been a lot of concern in terms of uh, the auto-populated return not being a self-assessment return. That is not the case. Uh, we are still looking at Section 28.4 of the Tax Procedures Act. Uh, 
the obligation of self-assessment still remains uh, a burden to the taxpayer. So ideally, you'll still be expected to submit the VAT return uh, by 20th of the following month. And uh, Sharon, is my screen, has my screen moved to the next page? Yes, right now we, we can see notwithstanding the announcements above section okay. twenty-eight. Okay, thank you for the confirmation. But I don't understand. Most people are saying they cannot see the screen. Yeah, that's that's why I'm okay. also I'm yeah. also concerned. Uh, because if you can see my slides are moving, so maybe the issue is on their end. Okay, yeah, maybe someone is advising them. Maybe they can log in and log out and log in again. All right, just go on. Please, um, if you can see our presentation, please type. Yeah, someone is saying, Erastas is saying, I can see your screen. All right, just proceed. Maybe they can log in and lo they can log out and log in again. Okay, so because of right. time, I'll try and be as brief as possible as requested. All right, now, yes. uh, for the electronic tax invoice. We are looking at, uh, we have exemptions to the same. The exemptions for the e-invoice are very, uh, are actually captured in section 23A4 of the Tax Procedures Act, which excludes uh, the following transactions, emolument subject to PYE, importation of goods, importation of services from a foreign country, interest income for financial institutions, investment allowances, airline passenger ticketing, any other exemption granted by the commissioner in accordance with the law. I'd like to just touch on, on that last part. We have seen uh, situations whereby um, uh, taxpayers have made submissions to policy on guidance on specific uh, issues or areas where the law is a bit gray. There is a gap on whether they are exempted to issue Electro electronic tax invoices or not. Now, once a private ruling has been issued by policy and you're granted that exemption, then that last part would actually apply to you. So those instances are there. I know the insurance, for example, I'll use that as an example, uh, insurance companies had done a similar submission, but the submission was not granted. And the directive was to ensure that they also issue electronic tax invoices. So that is within your right to do if if you're in an industry and you feel there's a gray area, whether you're supposed to issue an electronic tax invoice. Those taxpayers who are also trading in the digital marketplace are also supposed to, are also exempted from issuing electronic tax invoices. Now, the, gazette, the gazettement of the electronic tax invoice regulations 2024 will provide further guidance or any additional exclusions on the same. Now, I'd like just to do a very quick walkthrough of the key features of the VAT autopopulated return. The first being the introduction of the pipe character in the autopopulated CSV, CSV files. So you'll realize um, where your invoice number is captured in the Excel the CSV, I'm looking at the Excel itself. You'll realize that there is this pipe. I don't know if my mouse is visible, but there is this introduction. The purpose of this particular character we are calling a pipe is to ensure that the invoice number does not truncate. Teams invoices are 19 characters. If you're looking at e teams invoices, the first, uh, the CU number is usually 15 characters, then you have the slash, and then you have the invoice number after that. So you would look at, you're having more than 15 characters depending on what invoice number you're at in your business currently. So just to ensure that that's when you're importing the CSV file onto the VAT return, there is no truncation because you will get an error at the point of validation and submitting of your return. We introduced, we introduced a pipe um, in the CSV file. Uh, kindly give me a minute.
sorry about that. So the purposes of this, and you notice that for mostly where we're looking for, for when you're looking at um, for we're looking at uh, any any value that starts with a zero, it will truncate. So to avoid that, we introduce the pipe character. So we'll 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 move on to the next slide. So you'll realize, as you can see from my as you can see from my presentation. Under invoice number and the under the column header for invoice number, it truncates. It truncates. So just to avoid that at the point of importing your CSV, we introduce the pipe. Now there has been a lot of confusion about the date that is captured in the CSV file. Just a clarification: the date in the CSV file relates to the invoice date and not the transmission date. You'll appreciate with eTeams and Teams, there is a transmission date that is coming into play, and there's also the invoice date. So the date that we're actually capturing for you, or rather availing to you in the CSV file, only relate to the invoice date and not the transmission date. Now, transaction capacity in the VAT autopopulated return. What does this mean? Um, we did an enhancement by the time we were uh, going live in, um, we, we did the rollout in March, just to allow, especially taxpayers who have high volume transactions, not to have so many CSV files auto-populated for them, because we realized it was also affecting performance. So what we did for the particular CSV files that you are importing, meaning we are looking at B2, B2, where you have a VAT pin and you're importing that C CSV file on the return, the capacity of that uh, CSV file is 75,000. That is what it can hold in terms of transaction, line item transactions. But where you're looking at B2C, B2C transaction, I've walked into Naivas today, I've gone to buy lunch, I've been given a receipt. I did not issue my PIN. I am not registered for VAT in any way. So those transactions are the transactions that we are looking at where you're not registered for VAT. So the, we increased the capacity of that CSV file to actually accommodate a million transactions. So for a, just a normal taxpayer, my expectation would be if your transactions to, for B2C are less than a million, you'll only have one CSV file. If you're the big eight, when we looked at an, our analysis of the Kenyan market, we have the big eight taxpayers whose transactions in terms of volume surpass the 1 million mark. So the expectation is for those particular eight taxpayers in the market would actually surpass, would actually, they would actually have more than one CSV file. So there's that. Uh, So there's that also enhancement that has been done. So this slide basically just caps, captures that explanation. Now, if we look at the different uh, sales categories on the CSV, sales and purchases, categories in the VAT return, you'll appreciate that uh, section B relates to general rated, section C is no longer in law, section D relates to zero rated, and then section E relates to exempt. So there are two particular CSV files you will not get uh, as at today when you download the auto-populated return. And that relates to section D2. I think I'd seen someone asking that at the beginning before we started the session. And then section J as well. Now section J relates to uh, VAT on imported services and section D2 relates to exports. We are currently working on uh, section D2. It's one of the enhancements that we are closely working on. And by the time the, the goal or the vision is by the time we're rolling it out again, uh, making it that it will be mandatory, not mandatory to use it, but actually just switching on the validation rules because you can still get the CSV files even today, that the section D2 will be available for you. So that is something we are working on. We will communicate on the same once we do 
a, rev a revision of the step-by-step um, -step guide on filing using the VAT auto-populated return that can be found on our website. So please take note of those two CSV files because we've had instances where taxpayers ask why can't I get section D2? It is because it is not there. We did not avail it with the first rollout. Now, the removal of sheet C and sheet G, this relates to other rated sales and other rated purchases. Now, the timelines of when uh, those sheets were removed, of course, differ. For sec um, sheet C, other rated, the effective date was uh, August 2023, tax period for August 2023. And the reason why is if you can remember what happened in July 2023 when the Finance Act came into, in, to, into was officially uh, moved from a bill to an act, uh, it was actually, con it faced contention in law, in, in, in court rather, sorry about that, in court. So by the time the court gave a ruling on the same, that ruling came on 29th July. So for that particular month of July, you were still able to trade with other rated products, but now we were allowing you to, for that one month. So anyone from, uh, if you actually capture the date, you will notice the return itself, the VAT return, once you download it, still has the section C, and G. However, when you capture the period, the return period from and the return period to, you will realize that those two sheets close up. And we have done that in uh, with the provisions of the law. Now, we are aware that there's still some taxpayers who are actually issuing invoices as uh, under with the 8% uh, rate, which is of course, not the correct position, and it should not be happening. And we've, we've, we've realized that the challenge is that these updates have been pushed from KRA to the supplier. The supplier has pushed the same updates to the taxpayers' devices, but the taxpayers are yet to take up those updates in their devices, and that's why there's that that's difference. Now, when it comes to us in terms of compliance, how we are ensuring compliance, just be let me make you aware on the ground you could be issuing an invoice at eight percent so the burden transferred to the consumer you've only charged eight percent you've only collected eight percent but now when you come to filing and that invoice is also transmitted to kra the variance of the eight percent will ideally be collected from you because that particular product was not supposed to be sold at eight percent it was supposed to be sold at 16 percent and the issue is you have not ensured that the provisions of the law have been effected in your devices. So just take note that those compliance measures are already there. They are there in the auto-populated return, and they will take effect once we, we roll out. It, right now, I know such compliance checks are being done by the officers, but once we roll out, it will be a system-based compliance check. Now, we look at the adjustment of sales. This is basically a walkthrough of the validation rules that are there. Now, generated and transmitted ETIM steam sales invoices. Basically, what we're saying with the auto populated return is the rule is if you have made sales of, um, let's say, 100 million, let's use that as an example. For the month of uh, July, if we roll it out for the filing of the July return, uh, what we're saying is if these invoices of amount 100 million have been transmitted to Kenya Revenue Authority, you cannot declare an amount lower than 100 million. That is, that is given. So I know the biggest issue was on that. If there's a, there's a pain area we other than claiming of input tax, the sales part. And we, we've had enough meetings, enough technical meetings with suppliers, manufacturers uh, in regards to the sale, just to ensure that everything is aligned to the next rollout. Because the goal is once we roll it out again, there will no be switching off of the auto-populated return. We have ensured and we've even had uh, uh, test case scenarios in terms of dry runs uh, with uh, 
some of the taxpayers um, and we've confirmed and they've confirmed that all is well. We've had direct communication, direct calls, everything is okay. Now things are fine. So if transmitted is 100 million, the declaration cannot be 90 million. The system will reject. It will give you a pop-up. I'll share with you the pop-ups for the different categories of section B, D, and E. For section B, D, and E. Now, however, in the event that by the time you're going to file your return, because the guys who file early, they, they don't wait up to the due date. They can even file fast. By the time you're going to file your returns, those invoices are yet to be transmitted for one reason or the other. You will, you, it is expected of you by law, this is in law, that as long as a sale was made in a particular tax period to be declared in your return. So you cannot under declare any transactions that have been transmitted and have been availed to you through uh, the pre-populated return, but you are allowed to introduce it, anything that goes above. So what I'm saying is, say for example, the total sales you made were 100 million, for example. However, however, what has been availed for you in the auto-populated return is actually 90 million. So there's a gap of, from your books of accounting, there's a gap of 10 million missing. It is mandated and expected of you by law to actually declare the 10 million. What will happen, you might not declare the 10 million a transaction as a line item in your return, you will capture it as a lump sum because the validation checks in the sales, in all the sheets, both sales and purchases, we are validating line items. I know the first rollout, we were not validating line items for sales, but that one we've changed. We've done an enhancement. So we will validate the line items that you are importing on the CSV file. So the ideally the, the expectation is on the lump sum, that 10 million, where you have um, transactions between basically B to C, because that is where you capture B to C transactions, that is where you will capture it. But this is purely, purely for the invoices that are yet to be transmitted, what sold in that particular tax period. That is the expectation. Now, I'll, I've put a screenshot. I hope that is visible. The rules that I've just described will not just apply to your self-assessed return. It will also apply to your amended return, the data correction, additional assessment, and default assessment as well. So an example of a pop-up is, uh, a pop-up of what you had is what I'm saying. You see, like for this was section B, this is an error that was encountered for general rated sale where the taxpayer made an attempt to under declare, but the system brought a pop up um, of 80. You need to declare 88 million. Then the same check up is on the section D for zero rated as well. Now, this is how it looks and then for exempt as well. Uh, for 30,620. So those rules are very key. Now, the second part of this um, presentation is basically what I've just explained about the declaration of the 10 million uh, sales that you've made. They were not auto-populated for you, but you actually made that sale in that particular tax period. So as mandated by law, you're supposed to declare the same. The where of where to declare it is where I've highlighted in yellow. So that part, total sales and VAT to customers not registered for VAT. Uh, should be actually declared there. Now, declarations of sales by digital economy taxpayers. Now, this particular section of taxpayers is a bit unique. Remember, when we started the presentation, we said they are exempted. They are exempted by law from issuing an electronic invoice. However, 
um, you'll appreciate if you're registered for VAT. Say, for example, Grace has um, has has a business, and I'm registered for VAT. I am trading with, or I'm doing business with, for example, Showmax, who are exempted. What will happen? Me as Grace, when it comes to, although we'll touch it on claiming of input tax, I cannot claim input tax from Showmax until Showmax declares the same in their return. So what will happen, Showmax has to file the, their, their, their VAT return. Then in my auto-populated return, when I'm downloading the auto-populated return, I will have a section FDST. CSV file avail as part of my records. Now, the key features, of course, I don't expect the invoices from a DST taxpayer to have the normal structure of an E-Teams or Teams invoice because they're exempted. So basically what we're saying, the rules for a digital economy taxpayer is, one, when you're making that declaration in your return, you must make that declaration as a line item. I know the prior practice was they would declare the same as a lump sum. But if you declare that uh, transaction, any sale transaction as a lump sum, the other person on the other side, uh, the purchaser rather, will not be able to claim it. So it is key and of great importance that when you're filing your return, you capture each and every transaction as a line item, every single field. So that once you file your return, ITAX will be able to pull those records by the PIN of the purchaser and avail the same as a CSV file for them to claim input tax. Uh, declaration of sales supply. This one, I'll do it from memory if, if, if that is okay with you. Basically, what we're saying, this is in line with Section 15 of the VAT Act where we're looking at a deemed taxable supply. Now, at the most basic example I can give is Naiva Supermarket sells detergents or soaps. And then they take the same soap or detergent from their stock to clean their, to clean their business premise. So that becomes a deemed supply. So one of the, 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 the challenges we had in the first rollout was that those particular transactions will be availed as a sale in your CSV file and also as a purchase in your CSV file. So one of the major enhancements we did for so that just to allow, we, we will only be availed the same on the sales part. And then the declaration, because it will give you an error, just allow me just to switch my presentation just a minute. Just a minute, there's something I want to share on uh, self-supply. Give me a minute. Okay, I'm having a challenge sharing that particular document. But basically what I wanted to bring to the surface was if you're selling, if the self-supply has your PIN and the same is being auto-populated in your return, you will have an error message indicated PIN entered should not be same as taxpayer's PIN. Remember, you're importing that CSV file. You as Naivas, you are registered for VAT. So definitely 
that transaction will be auto populated in your CSV files. So, just to ensure that that error message does not limit you in terms when you're doing your filing of the VAT return, the particular transactions that have a redeemed taxable supply or a self supply in line with section 15 will be removed from the CSV file that you're importing. Then the total amount, remember the rules of sales, you cannot under declare. So as long as that particular transaction is appearing in your CSV files, it has to be accounted for. So you cannot account for it uh, by importing the CSV file. So you will remove those particular entries. Maybe they're just three, for example, amounting to 100,000. Then that lump sum, the taxable value of 100,000 will be shifted onto the lump sum amount for non-registered taxpayers. Because remember, we are validating the line item. And when you validate the line item, the PIN will be flagged. You are the one who's filing. Naivas is filing the return. But at the same time, they have a deemed supply. And that is why the system cannot allow it. So we are trying to currently, that is how it is. However, the vision and the end goal is we will do an enhancement so that we don't bother you with all that movement, moving transactions from this CSV file to the lump sum, such that it is a backend process. We will do it for you, that shifting, moving it from the CSV file that you're importing and moving and moving those transactions, the taxable value amount in the lump sum. So by the time we're rolling it out, that is how, that is the vision of how it will be. For now, it is as I have explained it, right? Then I believe for sales, we've captured everything. I'd like to do a very quick walkthrough on claiming of input tax. Now we have transmitted eating steam supplier invoices. The rule, the validation rule for input tax claiming, and this is where we had the biggest, biggest challenge uh, in the last rollout, is you cannot overclaim. So last time when we did the rollout, we realized that the biggest issue was, yes, invoices, you were issued with an invoice, but your PIN was not captured. Remember our rules, the validation is on the line item. The key, one of the key components to the auto-populated return, even just right now, is your PIN is mandatory. You, actually, your KRA PIN is mandatory. So if what has been transmitted to KRA, because I remember in the, there was a lot of back and forth that this was our system issue and it was not a system issue it was at source because again this issue affected teams a lot your pin was not captured yes you have an invoice you have it physically but your pin was not captured now those are the issues we were looking at one-on-one -on -one with suppliers and how they would actually uh, fix the issues with their respective taxpayers so for you to claim it as a line item, as a line item, then the key features of that should also be there and they should also be correct. So we're looking at the pin of the supplier as a key feature. We're looking at the invoice number. Is it an E-Teams Teams invoice? We're looking with the exception of DST. Remember the explanation for DST. Is it an in that you're looking at the invoice date and we're also looking at the taxable amount. Those four have to be precise with how it, the data has been transmitted. It cannot vary. So for you to claim input tax, so you cannot overclaim. That is my point. However, 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 I know when we usually say that there is a confusion of the six month rule. We are not saying that you cannot claim invoices for prior months, the overclaiming, for example, if we were filing the July 2024 returns, or rather let's, let's use the return that is currently being filed right now, if auto-populated had been switched on, the June 2024 returns, you can only claim uh, invoices for the month of June 2024, but you can also introduce you can introduce invoices that you did not claim in May, that you did not claim in uh, April, you did not claim in March, as long as you have not claimed them in the prior 
periods because that that check is in place and it will be flagged. If it, if there is an attempt of claiming an invoice more than once, it will be picked by by the system. So there is always that when we say you cannot overclaim, we restrict it to the tax period, but you can introduce uh, invoices that you had not claimed from a prior tax period that you are yet to claim in the return. Now, because remember, the auto-populated return will not, under any circumstances, um, that's the, what's the word, a conflict with the law. It aligns, the rules that have been put in place align with how the law is. Now, um, the other introduction that we did was the mandatory declaration of credit notes when it comes to purchases. Now, we realized that um, a sale was being made, a credit note was being issued, but the same credit note is not being declared on the purchases side. So the mandatory declaration of the credit notes, this is where it comes in. So it will be auto-populated for you. And I remember there was a lot of um, a, a lot of questions around this area because there's always a message of your relevant invoice number, this with relevant invoice date, this was not declared. So please declare, declare it. Now, anytime, let me say it as a pro tip, anytime uh, the system communicates. I know we take them as error messages, but they're not ideally error messages. It's just a system communicating something. There's a gap. There's something you've not done. Go back and recheck it. So anytime you, you see a pop-up that talks about a relevant, your relevant invoice number, tie that message to a credit note automatically. Automatically tie it to a credit note. That is what we are talking about. That there is an issue with the, at that particular with a credit note that is how you know it because i remember not so many people were aware what those messages meant now this will become mandatory you cannot remove them you cannot remove you see that with 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 purchases you have the ability to remove an invoice say um you made a purchase in june you're not ready to claim it for that particular for whatever reason you're not ready to claim it in the filing season, so you remove it. The removal is allowed. That rule is still there. Even right now, how the normal VAT return works, you can remove that invoice. What you cannot remove is a credit route. That one has to be, keyword is mandatory. That one has to be claimed. Just a minute. That one has to be claimed. So those ones will be retained in the auto-populated return. Now, um, the other biggest maybe challenge we've realized is where you've done business with someone. I went and did business with Nivas. Um, or maybe I supplied Nivas with something, for example. But at the point of Nivas filing the returns, my PIN for Grace Incorporated gets flagged that uh, Nivas cannot claim input. The, the exact message is usually the PIN, whatever PIN it is, is not eligible for VAT input deduction. What that usually communicates is me as Grace Incorporated, I have sold to Nivas. Nivas needs to claim the VAT in the VAT, the VAT uh, related in our transaction in their return. But when they make that attempt, the system flags. It is for the simple reason Grace Incorporated has been placed on special table, VAT special table. Now, the special table is basically a, me a mechanism implemented on ITAX to enhance VAT compliance, whereby certain categories of VAT registered taxpayers are blacklisted, and I put that in quotes, and that's restricted from performing certain ITAX processes. In line with this check, no taxpayer will be allowed to claim input tax using the pins on the special table. 
This relates to an original invoice only. However, if as Grace Incorporated, I issued a credit note to Nivas, and yes, I'm on special table, we did a relaxation in um, the auto-populated return to allow, remember the other rule uh, for mandatory declaration of, the, uh, of credit notes so that it doesn't conflict with that rule, that particular credit note will still be, will not be rejected by the system. So let's differentiate the two. If I've issued Nivas with an original invoice, that one will not go through until my issues, my compliance issues are sorted out with KRA. And then the credit note will actually sail through in terms of the filing process. So take note of that as well. Then um, you can have a situation whereby um, at the point of you doing business with someone, they actually had a VAT obligation, basically. But when you go to claim that particular invoice for whatever reason, you come to realize that you are unable to claim from that particular taxpayer, say Grace Incorporated, because their VAT obligation has been deactivated. So at the point of you transacting with them, doing business with them, it was valid. But things happened along the way or in that particular tax period, and then now it got to a position whereby they are unable, you are unable to claim that particular invoice because the obligation has been uh, has been deactivated. So the error message is the PIN, whichever PIN it is for invoice, it will specify the invoice was not active for VAT on the invoice date. Now that's an issue that can be sorted out at TSO, but it can only be sorted out by me as Grace. So the, the, the let me say the positive side of it is claiming of that invoice, you're allowed to claim it within six months. So if I can be able to sort out my issues with KRA, then you will be able to claim that invoice. So that's the other, that's the other rule about there. Uh, the other challenge we've noted that a lot of taxpayers were experiencing with uh, purchases. Now, when it comes to the digital market space, that one I've already explained it because how, how um, invoices or rather filing of the VAT returns for D2 taxpayers, it's quite unique. Something, one, one activity or one event has to happen so that this other event takes place. So for me to claim from Showmax, Showmax must file their return and not just file their return, but actually declare, de, sorry, declare that transaction as a line item. That is the only way I'll claim it. So that needs to be taken into, into con consideration. Then I think the biggest, I think, maybe, can I, let me not call it a gap that we've seen recently in the past few months is claiming of input tax from imports. Now, um, there are some rules we've put in place for import validation of uh, the v even just now with the VAT return without even the auto populated return. Um, and I'll take you through the same. Now, the taxpayer must, uh, the conditions before system accepts the claiming of that import entry, we're looking at uh, the import entry number should be valid and issued through the carrier custom systems. The import entry has not uh, been claimed in any of the previous returns. The pin of the claimant consignee as per the custom entry is the one filing the VAT return and claiming the custom entry. The entry had vertible supplies with VAT at 16%. Then all taxes have been fully, sorry, sorry. The status of the entry in ICMS should be settled. If the status of the entry is pending release, pending removal under control or cancel, that particular, that particular custom entry, that particular custom entry cannot be cleaned until that status has been corrected. Now you'll find a scenario where all those checks have, you've ticked all your boxes, all of them, it's settled or removed. Uh, you can see it, you've logged into ICMS, you can see it. What maybe we would want to appreciate is that availing the same data to ITAX takes 
about a day. Uh, so if you're doing that on 20th, you might not be able to actually claim that custom customs entry number in the period for that particular tax period if you're filing your VAT return plus one. So that is the only way you'll be able to claim it. So I know that is the how the currently the, the 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 rules are. We are not planning on changing it. We can improve it maybe down the line, but I know for right now that is how it is. So for imports, I know there has been a lot of concerns on the same where you're trying to claim an import entry and you're unable. But support should be given from your account managers. I'm I'm, I'm always perplexed when a taxpayer asks me who is an account manager. Every taxpayer in every tier so has been mapped to an account manager. There is an officer somewhere assigned to address your needs. That is there actually internally. So I'm I'm always perplexed when 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 even just getting data for autopopulated because uh, there's a time maybe our 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 reports were not up to date we've facilitated internally officers where they can generate the same report and give it to even if you wanted your report on first of the month or fifth of the month that report can be availed to you that is what we have right now the vision is we create for you a dashboard on itax portal where you just click any time of the month any time of the month and those and those invoices are availed to you that is the vision it's something actually we are working on i i know it's something on the pipeline so that we also remove that of a dependency of an account manager such that if i was to log in today and i want my invoices as at 18th july i'm able to actually access them so that is the vision that is the goal and my hope and prayer is that we can also deliver the same by 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 the time we are rolling it back out to the market now i believe i've i'm done with uh, claiming of input tax then we also did an enhancement on the invoice checker where you are availed additional information from what especially for teams invoices because those are those a cry and a plea from the market where when the issue of they could not claim input um, tax on invoices where their pins had not been captured during transmission, the, the physical invoice you can see has your pin, but the actual transmission to KRA did not have your pin. So we did an enhancement on the same. We are also giving you the transmission date and the time the invoice type whether it's an original a credit note or a debit note the buyer name the supplier name and invoice category so those ones i know we already did i know we might have done that release a little after we had uh, switched it off could be april or may i don't have the exact date but i know we've done that We've done that availing. We've done an, an improvement. I've been made aware it's not, there's an issue with the checker currently, but we've notified ICT so that they can look into the same. Now, I've seen someone making a request on the presentation that I've done. I'd like just to notify you, we did, uh, we availed, we prepared an FAQ document on the VAT autopopulated return last week. Uh, we published it on our website. So if you go to our website, just a minute, let me see if I can share that bit. Oh, I've, finally, my document shares. Wow. Okay, so this is what I was trying to demonstrate. Can, can, that, can that presentation be seen? Paul or Sharon kindly confirm or someone, yes. So this is what basically I was actually trying just to explain. This is the document I'm talking about. This is what is available, but I wanted to show you the journey of actually accessing it. So let me just switch. Let me just stop and then switch it. I, I walk you through.
I think you can see our website. So I've accessed our website. So when you go to publications here, where my casa is, you see uh, there is all ITAX downloads, auctions, reports, guides, and manuals, court rulings, forms, acts and policies, customs, downloads, tax addiction, items. Now I want you to access tax education because that is where we have uh, published it. The first document here, frequently asked questions on the VAT, uh, auto-populated VAT return. This is where it is, and that is where it is accessible. Now, I want to just address, I, I can see a lot of questions around withholding. Certificates, I know it's very off the discussion. Yes, we are aware that currently when you log on to your ITAX portal, you're not able to download or access any withholding certificate for both the withholder and the withholding. Even prior records are missing. So it's an issue we are aware of and ICT is looking at it. The other issue around withholding certificates is even once payment has been done, you did not receive the email. Because usually when 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 payment has been done and the certificate is generated, the same is sent to you on email. So there are those two issues around certificates. However, um, what we've guided our officers internally uh, for purposes of filing, the same certificates can be extracted because on our end, that's, those certificates are there. So if you can get in touch with your account manager or any support uh, center, they can actually, as long as you have, if it's someone specific or there is an issue of services will be denied because they are saying that you did not, you did not remit, th there's an issue of that, and you want to avail the certificate, an officer can retrieve it for you from back office. We can, we are still able. It's, we were hoping we would have sorted it out by 20th, but I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure about the timeline, but from back office, what we've asked our officers to do through our um, internal escalation framework is they can they can actually access your entire schedule for withholding for the month of June 2024, for example, and then actually reprint for you those certificates. It's not the ideal so solution, I know. I'm not justifying it, but as we wait for us to actually resolve the issue, then that is our backup at the moment. And actually do apologize for that um, system challenge from our end. Um, I believe I'm done, Susan. Um, I would like to just go through the chats and see which questions I can, I can pick up as I uh, hand it over to you. I meant Sharon. I'm sorry about that. Sorry, 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 Sharon. Um, I don't know if my colleagues are there, Paul and Sharon, but let me just try to skim through um, the questions that have come in. Yes. Currently, right now, when you download the auto-populated return, the CSV files are missing the name for section B, section D, and section, I know that issue is on the three, section B, section D, and section E. The names of the buyers are missing. So that issue, when we did the rollout in um, March, the names were there. It's just that we haven't run it, because it's not really in use in terms of the validations you can still file manually we have not run the script for us for you to for us to auto populate for you the names so we actually are aware it's there the names are missing but i know it's something that will be in place just the same way when we did the rollout in uh, um march 2024 the names will be there so it's it, there's, there's a procedure that has to be done for the names to be there. We've just not done it in the past few months. 
because as long as the content or the details of the um, of the other details are available maybe that is what there has been a laxity on the same i'll pick it up on my end but we are aware about the names but when we did the rollout the names were there it was one of the um checklist items and then um Someone has asked if we are filing your returns manually or using the auto-populated. The auto-populated return has the, the validation. Let me use the word. The validation rules of the auto-populated return have not been switched on. The training is just a better understanding or familiarization of the auto-populated return. Because from our last switch off, people have gone to a point of embracing it. Like they usually download the auto-populated to confirm the invoices that are there and what they are filing. So manual filing of the VAT return still applies. The validation rules have not, I repeat, have not been switched on. At the point of us switching it on, I guarantee you a public notice will be issued from Kenya Revenue Authority on the same. I cannot confirm the rollout date of the auto-populated return. That is something that will be done through a public notice because um, we need to get um, a guidance from management on the same. I've seen a random question on amnesty because um, our office still handles amnesty. So I'll, I'll address it. Remember, amnesty was tax amnesty was introduced by Fini the Finance Act for 2023. The expiry of the same amnesty was 30th June 2024, which is this year. Now, the bill that was recently rejected had the was bringing was giving it an extension such that it would have been extended up to next year march the proposal was uh, march 2025 however with the bill being rejected then it meant even that particular aspect of the amnesty went with the bill so amnesty actually ended on 30th june 2024 and has already been switched off so there is no further amnesty on the same. I think for Safaricom, and, and I wish Paul could admit and just, I stand to be corrected, but I believe Safaricom have finally onboarded onto eatings. They finally onboarded, we have their invoices, we've verified, we had, they're actually being transmitted. So the issue, that was there with Safaricom even in March, because we were actually doing the manual availing of those uh, invoices. That one has been resolved. Safaricom should have been have fully onboarded by now. I think uh, my colleague from Etims is here. I, I, Paul, I wish he would clarify, but I believe that's the position because I remember testing an invoice from them and. It was been it had been transmitted and were able to validate it. So Safaricom issue is no longer an issue. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Grace. I would like to reiterate that uh, Safaricom is a uh, uh, compliant now, and they have uh, their unique ways, a uh, unique way of uh, invoicing. So. What is important uh, to note that uh, for taxpayers who are dealing with the uh, Safaricom, uh, you are supposed to give out your uh, KRA PIN, as earlier mentioned by Grace, uh, for you to claim that particular uh, maybe invoice. Uh, thank you, thank you. 
Um, I don't know if Sharon is uh, still in the session with us. I would like to hand it over to her as I skim through the chat as well. I can see we are 16 minutes past our time, though we started a few minutes late. So Sharon, if you could hear me, kindly respond. As I, as I wait for my colleague, um, Sharon, to just uh, log back in, uh, she's having challenges with um, unmuting, but um, I'd like to just emphasize as much as um, the electronic invoice in the past has been greatly related to the VAT return, remember how the law is currently that for you to claim an expense, and this is effective this year, by uh, Income Tax Act, for you to claim any expense in under the income tax, whether you're a company or a sole proprietor, you, that expense must be supported by an e-teams invoice or teams invoice. So that is a reality that we I know we will find we will face it come come out come next year when we are filing the returns, but ensure compliance. Ensure compliance on the same so that you don't have your expenses being disallowed as long as they don't align with Section 23A4 of the TPA in terms of exemption who are exempted or there is no private ruling to the same effect that the KRA or the Commission has granted you authorization that you do not issue an electronic invoice. So just take that in note. The Finance Act 2023 brought a lot of inclu inclusivity. It brought all obligations on board, and that's a key item we're also looking at. There will be enhancements for the same. Also, the vision is also auto-populating the same. So please be aware of that and comply where possible, kindly. Not where, yeah, where possible in with the provisions of the law in mind. Back to you, Sharon. I don't know if you've been able to log in. Grace, I don't know if you can hear me now. Mm. 
Good afternoon once again. Sorry, I'm having um issues with my connection. Sorry for that. Okay, Grace, uh, thank you for that uh, very insightful session. So maybe what we'll do, I can see we have a lot of questions coming in. Maybe we'll uh, put together all those questions and then we can send it to to our taxpayers once it's um it's been uh because it's a q and answer question so we can send it as a question and answer through their email addresses from here i can see one question uh, for e teams Paul, I don't know if you are able to see from your end. Uh, it just disappeared from this other end. I have a problem with the connection. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, there's so, a question that I just saw. Yeah. I've seen a question in regards to just a minute. In regards to e teams. Uh, someone has just asked uh, do the e teams receive for uh, expenses? Uh, have to be a pin or they are okay as long as they are uh, an e-teams receipt. Remember, if you have to claim for the purposes of uh, uh, <clears throat> claiming the input tax, you have to indicate you are, provide your pin to your seller so that it uh, now captures it on, uh, on the receipt. So without the pin, you cannot be able to claim the input. However, if it, it, it doesn't have a pin, it's still valid. You can use it as the final consumer. I think there is one more. Uh, we have uh, several uh, expenses that cannot provide us with e teams invoice such as uh, offloading casual uh, workers that we pay for. What can we do? So you can advise them to dial start report to ash. Uh, then uh, they follow the form, then issue with the meetings, compliant invoice through the e citizen page. I think that's all. Uh, kindly clarify if everyone needs to be registered for e teams, if you are already teams compliant, if you're already uh, teams compliant the Teams devices, uh, you are not compelled to register for eTeams. However, if you face uh, recurring challenges, you can move to eTeams. But for now, if you are, you have the, the Teams device and it's a compliant device, it transmits, uh, it, tra it does tra transmit the, uh, the invoices and even the, uh, your customers, when they give you the PIN, you'll be able to transmit together with the buyer's PIN uh you there is no need of uh, moving to e teams i think uh, uh one more i've just answered it uh, this one we have several expenses yeah you can uh, just advise them to use the start report to ash they follow the prompts they capture your pin so you'll be able to uh, to claim that as a deductible expense if it uh, qualifies when you'll be doing now your annual returns 
Then uh, the suppliers are claiming challenges in inputting bias KRA pin on Teams devices and these are allowed to claim. So for the suppliers, there is no challenge unless if you have a, a special challenge that is based on a, that is individual based, you can channel to our to our team support at kra.go.ke. That is our official email for the e-teams so that we'll be able to respond to such if they're uh, facing challenges in uh, capturing your buyer at their buyer's pin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Then uh, maybe I think I've tried to exhaust the uh, for Safari Compass purchases, like for airtime for prepaid customers. How do we claim? Uh, you can liaise with the Safari Com. Uh, because initially you can liaise with them so that they see how they can sort you on that. I think I've tried to exhaust the issues of uh, e-teams, confirm whether the debt to be used in teams debt, uh, is teams debt or the trader uh, invoicing debt. You should be using the e-teams debt and the e-teams invoice number as well because you are a great mentioned about uh, transmission date uh, is not uh, important what is important is the date of uh, the date you you generated the the invoice or the invoices Oh, uh, we do uh, we do not receive a teams teams compliant from government institutions like Kentra. Uh, please advise. Uh, you, uh, we currently we there are a number of government institutions that have come on board. Uh, some are also trying to come on board through e teams uh, integration, uh, and therefore, if uh, maybe they are not able to give you the Teams or Teams compliant invoices, you can as well write to us email on the same for us to follow up at teamsupport.kra.go.ke. Uh, thank you, Sharon. I think I've tried to exhaust the uh, eTeams Teams questions. Okay, thank you, Paul. Yes. Uh, maybe there's one that I can, before you close the session, uh, this goes to Grace. Uh, I don't know if we had answered this, Grace. It's from Kenyan. He's saying, can you please also check the below question? What might be the, what might be causing the error? Modifications are not saved. Upload file not generated. Cannot access B generated self. Uh, CSV. This error comes when validation is done and trying to generate an upload file for VAT. We are unable to generate the uploaded to upload file. Thank you, Sharon. I had actually noted that question down. I wanted to address it. We've realized we've gotten a, a, a number of we've 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 noted um, a number of. Um, of that missed of that rather officers notifying us that taxpayers are having that challenge but we've narrowed down i don't know if kenyan can confirm uh we've no, narrowed it down that it is affecting anyone who's using microsoft 365. i think there was a similar issue during the PYE filing season and now i can see VAT is also affected unfortunately so for now as we look as we look at uh, a permanent solution uh Either an officer can can validate the return and file for you the return through back office. That is also a possibility. And because uh, right now that is the only option I'm looking at until we resolve it. Because it's only a specific or use um, 
<laughs> a laptop that is not using Microsoft 365. Those are the two options right now. We've taken note of it. We apologize for the same. Um, but yes, that problem is there. It, it is affecting a few, not everybody, because I've seen a return I have received today. I've been able to validate it from my end in Kiare, and the tax, we've been able to facilitate the taxpayer on filing the return. So that issue is there. I'm genuinely hoping we can do a delivery of the solution before the end, by before Saturday, which is the due date. But yes, I confirm that that problem is there. Uh, thank you, Algres. Uh, thank you, Algres. Okay, I can see uh, we are past um, 30 minutes. an epic uh, question and answer Q and a then we'll send it to all the taxpayers who attended the session also note that we have other sessions that will be Uh, Sharon, we lost you. Kindly, but as as you come back on, there is a question from uh, Jimmy, and um, I take a note of it. That if a taxpayer has been placed on the VAT special table, then why issue an invoice that you cannot claim from them? Remember. You being placed on on the special table does not mean your VAT obligation has been cancelled. That is not the implication. You're still registered for VAT, but there's some compliance issues that have been identified with your PIN and how you're trading, and that is why you've been placed on the VAT special table. So ideally, an invoice, uh, an invoice or rather for a person placed on VAT special table should still align with the law. It's just a compliance measure or an enforcement measure. So that one does not change. The obligation, that taxpayer still, is still registered or has the, ob the obligation for VAT. So that should not alter um, how you're invoicing. But we've taken note of the suggestion that we need a forum for specifically Q&A and I actually agree because the presentation takes quite a bit, a chunk of time. And uh, we will look at that as a way of better improving the sessions for taxpayer education. I, I submit and back to you, Sharon. I don't know if you've been able to come back. Yes, I. you can hear me now. Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Thank you, Grace. I was just trying to end the session and I was saying if you could have your parting shot, but since you've talked, maybe we can hand it over to Paul, then we end the session. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for attending the session. Uh, from uh, myself and uh, the eTeams team, if you have any challenges uh, in regards to eTeams, and teams per se, you can ch always channel them to team support at kra.go.ke for follow up and uh, guidance on the same. Thank you and have a good time. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, thank you for that. So maybe what I'll do, I'll just end the session with a word of prayer. And then uh, please keep checking your emails. We'll be sending the questions the answers from the questions that you've asked today, and we'll be inviting you for more sessions going onward. Thank you so much, and to wish you a lovely day. Let's pray. 
might be an everlasting job at King of Glory. We say thank you for this wonderful session that we've had. So when as we part into different sessions or activities, may we use whatever we learned today, may it generate more um, revenue from what we've learned and what we've understood. I pray this prayer, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.